Hi, I'm Lance Cottrell, Chief Scientist at Intrepid, and today I want to talk about a practical example of applying the threat modeling methodology for managed attribution solutions that I talked about in the last episode. In this episode, we're going to be looking at threat modeling, an imaginary OSINT operation where the operators are trying to monitor a closed discussion group on some large social media platform. Two of the primary objectives of this are to ensure that the operator is able to blend in effectively within this closed discussion group of very paranoid and fairly sophisticated individuals, and second, that they're not detected as being an alias by the social media platform itself because they're getting very aggressive at trying to detect those accounts and shut them down. So to really quickly recap the methodology we talked about in the last episode, the core threats that we're looking at specific to managed attribution, we use describe with the acronym CAKED, which stands for Correlation of Entities, Attribution of Actors, Knowledge of Operation, Exposure of Aliases, and Discovery of Resources. Right? Those are the threats that are misattribution specific, in addition to all the normal security threats that also need to be taken into account. And for the purposes of this analysis, we look at four different kinds of threat actors who will be conducting those kinds of attacks, and they are the unprivileged observer, someone who's on the wire monitoring the communications, someone who's on the device able to directly intercept information from the computer or server, and finally, someone who's in the conversation, one of the people that you're actually exchanging messages with. In this case, that'll be the people in the discussion group we're trying to monitor. So in this first diagram, we're looking at a user, an operator going out and conducting this operation directly without using any kind of managed attribution solution whatsoever. They're making a direct connection to the social media platform right from their computer. And you'll also see that there's a phone link to the social media organization. In this case, that's the SMS number that they're using to do multi-factor authentication and confirm their real personhood to the social media company. And we're seeing that a lot. Often you need to be able to have a unique real cell phone to get that confirmation text before any of these sites will allow you to set up a new account. So there's a couple of places that threat actors could obviously be sitting in this scenario. They could be watching the connection between the operator and the ISP, for example. And if they were to watch that, it would be immediately obvious that someone at that operator's organization, some government entity probably, is conducting an online operation on the social media platform. Right? Anyone watching that connection could immediately draw that conclusion. So that means we've got attribution of the actor potentially and knowledge of an operation. And of course, the, IS, the social media company is on the device. They have access to all the information that's going on. So they potentially could be seeing both the conversation that's taking place and the identity of the organization. So there, we really have full attribution of all the activities. It identifies the alias, it associates it with that operator, and they're completely exposed. But we sort of expected that because this is just a direct connection. Right? They're not doing any precautions to protect themselves. So what things might we want to add to mitigate those known threats, those known vulnerabilities that we've just discovered with very superficial analysis of the situation. So this might be a next step in the solution that we'd want to design. We're going to employ a managed attribution platform, and that can help with all the system fingerprints that might be exposed and visible to both the social media company as well as to the participants in the discussion room. And it can manage cookies, it can separate identities, it's gonna take care of a lot of those uh, technological identifiers that I've talked about before in the technical misattribution episodes that I've done. And of course, we've added in addition to that an extra relay hop before we get to the social media company. And we've done that because it's often just as bad to identify the presence of a managed attribution service provider as it is to directly attribute all the way back to the operator. Because most of these providers work with one or only a few different organizations or governments. And so being able to identify the entity 
is similar to attributing the government, even if it doesn't tell you exactly who in the government might be behind an operation. Then we're also doing the same with the phone because we don't want to see a discrepancy. We don't want the social media company to be able to see the data traffic coming out of one location, but yet the phone number is still overtly associated with that organization, or at least that organization's geography. So in this solution, we're having a cell phone that's being used remotely in that location so that we can offset that as well. So now both the data and the SMS are consistent in what that social media company sees. Now, hopefully that will reduce the chances of them detecting this as in any way unusual or suggestive of alias activity. The managed attribution solution can also help with the human factors. It can make sure that each different alias is associated with the correct accounts. You're not accidentally crossing the streams or misusing uh, identifiers or other information between different aliases. And that helps protect against threats within the conversation. And because the conversation is taking place in a social media context, the people in that conversation don't have access to a lot of raw data. They're seeing the same user interface that any other user is going to see, so they don't get a lot of technical metadata. So most of the tradecraft that needs to be in, uh, used to protect the operation is on the softer side, making sure that you blend in appropriately, that your language and behavior and slang and all of those other things are gonna be consistent to make sure that you don't attract attention. But we do have a couple of new possible locations for threat actors, and that's in and around that new relay node, which may, in some cases, be Oconus. It might be somewhere else other than in a protected, trusted location, say, inside the United States. And that may, may need to be done for, uh, consistency with the identity of the alias that you're using. But if there is the hosting provider, for example, they may be able to get access to that server and could then see traffic going in both directions. So that entity is now a point of vulnerability because they might be able to attribute the managed service provider's activity with that social media site. And any traffic in the clear, they'd be able to snoop. But fortunately, most of those communications are running over encrypted links in any case. And then there's the chance that there's backbone ISPs involved. And we sort of waved over that in the first example, that first analysis. But now that we've got multiple hops, we need to think there may be organizations that are able to see the traffic between each one of those hops. They might be able to see traffic leaving the operator's machine arriving at the managed uh, attribution service provider's services, you know, their data center, going to the relay point and then maybe off to the uh, social media company and perhaps even from there off to the destination and see the connections out to the targets. A large international backbone level company might have the ability to see any or all of that. However, leveraging that information is really difficult. Are you able to recognize that packet A corresponds to packet Z over here when they probably have been encrypted? They're going to be coming out of different IP addresses. There'll be small delays involved. It's not easy to be able to put those pieces together. It really is a needle in a haystack because these large ISPs are handling gargantuan amounts of data. And fortunately, when you look at the topology of your solution, you can know who are those big ISPs in that chain who might actually be in a position to extract that kind of data. And are they likely to be doing so? Is this an organization that's sympathetic to uh, the operator's organization? Is this an, uh, an ISP that is in a country where the government is very paranoid about this kind of thing and maybe watching very closely? So understanding who is it that has visibility throughout the chain can help you make those decisions about is this something we need to mitigate or is this a risk that we're willing to accept? Because this can quickly get out of hand if you try to mitigate against every possible threat, including uh, very remote dangers from extremely large ISPs with tremendous amounts of visibility, it takes enormous amounts of effort to then make sure that there are hops that they can't see and to traffic shape to make sure that they can't recognize traffic patterns in and out. It can be done, but it can change the cost of an operation by an order of magnitude. Now this is really just a toy model to show how to do this kind of analysis. 
Right? We're looking at each one of those elements in our solution and saying, are any of the kinds of threat actors appropriate here? Is there someone who can be on the wire in this location? Are there people who can be on the wire and see multiple locations? Are there possibilities of someone being on a server? And what are the odds of that? Right? Is this a trusted entity or is this sort of a fly-by-night place that we've rented a server? Because perhaps it's cover appropriate to have a server in that location, but it brings with it its own vulnerabilities and risks. Are the people in the conversation able to do analyses and look closely at the communications we're engaging in? Each one of those points in the chain, each kind of threat actor has to be analyzed for their ability to see and conduct any of those threats. Can they correlate entities? Can they recognize that if you have two aliases engaging on the same platform, that they're really the same person? And in this case, that might not be easy for the people in the conversation, the people in the discussion group, but unless we're pretty careful and use disparate relay nodes and different cell phone numbers and different infrastructure, it might be something that's pretty clear to the social media company, which could lead them to shutting down the account and causing the operator now to have to create entirely new aliases, which will then take time to get infiltrated and trusted into that closed paranoid discussion group to try to resume the OSINT collections that they were already conducting. And this is all really just a toy model, right? We've left out a lot of details about how things get set up and what other accounts might be involved. But the purpose here was to show the process that we're going through to look at this and how we can identify the threats and vulnerabilities and think about creating new mitigations for them and then analyzing those mitigations to understand if they expose us to new or different threats, what threats we are still accepting and whether those are something that we can live with or that we need to take further precautions against. In the next episode, I'm gonna conduct a similar threat modeling exercise against a different operational scenario, and that'll allow us to look at how this applies in different kinds of situations. Thanks for watching. I hope you found this episode useful and interesting, and if you did, please like and subscribe, and then click the bell icon to make sure you're notified each time new episodes are released. We upload new content every other week, and we'd love to hear from you about what topics you'd like us to cover. So let us know down in the comments. Till next time, ciao.